Well, good morning, church. Uh, for those of you who have not met me, my name is Clement. I'm one of the ministry apprentices here at Grace Point. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, when, uh, as we come before your word, uh, Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord, that your word speaks truth and your word is the very word that transforms our hearts and our minds before you. And so, Lord, as we come, may we come humbly to receive your word and pray, Lord, that your word will accomplish what you have purposed for it to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you have been on social media, chances are, you would have seen these challenges that people join to win a prize. These challenges can range from making someone laugh in order to get 20 bucks to breaking up with your partner in order to get a thousand bucks. And trust me, people actually do join these challenges as well. Now, one thing you will notice is that when the stakes are high, that is when people have a, uh, something serious to consider. What are they willing to lose in order to win the prize? What are they willing to lose in order to win the prize? Generally, the last thing that people are willing to lose is their pride. You see, pride has to do with our feelings of self-worth. And human pride has a way of dictating what we are willing or unwilling to do. So, on one end of the spectrum, pride makes us do really stupid things to prove our worth. On the other end, pride can stop us from asking help. It can stop us from acknowledging our faults in an argument, and it can stop us from admitting how little we understand. So, as a result, it ends up harming ourselves and our relationships. And as we come to the portion of Mark's Gospel, we will see how pride shapes the way we approach Jesus. So, you will find the sermon outline in your bulletins. And as we consider how we are called to approach Jesus, we will look at the following points. Point one, what we assert in our approach, what we assert in our approach. Point two, what we need to acknowledge in our approach, what we need to acknowledge in our approach. And third point, what we need to accept in our approach, what we need to accept in our approach. And what we will learn is to truly approach Jesus, we need to surrender our pride by accepting who we are and accepting who he is to surrender our pride by accepting who we are and accepting who he is. So come with me to point one, the assertion in our approach. Now, if you have been following along in our Mark series, you would notice that in the opening verses of Mark 7, that tension is building. You know, like throughout the course of Mark, Jesus had become really well known. He taught with authority. He did amazing miracles. And last week, Tom has shown us that he fed 5,000 people. It's clear that he is someone that you don't want to mess with. Yet all of this did not stop the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, from confronting him on one key issue, the issue of defilement. So have a look with me at verse 5. Verse 5 reads, So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? This was the issue that the Pharisees wanted to raise. Jesus, your disciples did not wash their hands before they eat. Now, for them, it is not necessarily an issue of hygiene, but it is an issue of being defiled. So you see, the word defiled refers to being unclean or it refers to making something go from pure to impure. It's not really a word that we use today, but we sort of understand the concept. Like imagine inviting your friends over to your place. It's during summer, you guys are full sweaty and dusty from running outside. And without asking, they throw themselves onto your bed and start rolling around. You will rightly say, oh gross, dude, you just defiled my bed. In saying that, what we mean is that our friends have made our bed impure. So, based on this religious concept, the Pharisees and the Jews would conduct a ceremonial washing of their hands, as well as many other practices, which Mark explains in verses 3 to 4. Now, notice these traditions would require you to get things right in order to remain pure. They would dictate every single little detail, from the right and wrong ways of washing your hands, to the quantity of the water, 
the position of your hands and the type of basin you need to use. You know, kind of like our pastors when it comes to drinking coffee, right? You know, you, you hear them all the time. Oh, the beans need to be decent. Oh, the grind needs to be right. Oh, the milk needs to be frothed at the right angle or temperature or else the coffee is defiled. Now, most of us growing up and listening to sermons will often have a really bad impression of the Pharisees. Yet, it will be good to slow down and at least consider their position. You know, to the Jews, to the Pharisees, being defiled and impure affects the way you interact with everything. Like a virus, your impurity can be transmitted. For example, Numbers chapter 19, verse 22 tells us, Numbers chapter 19, verse 22 Anything that an unclean or defiled person touches becomes unclean. And anyone who touches it becomes unclean till evening. That is why the issue of ceremonial washing was important to the Jews. Like COVID, being unclean and impure can separate someone from their community. And on top of that, being impure and approaching God in an impure state is highly offensive and disrespectful. It is not something that God takes lightly. And so, to, to the Pharisees' credit, they did their best to impose what they thought was best and right. Hence, all the traditions and all the regulations. The intention of these rules and regulations is not to only protect the Jews from being coming impure from what they do. It also helped them avoid from being influenced and defiled by pagan worship practices around them. And for those of us in this room who are followers of Jesus, we, we can relate. You know, like sometimes we do certain things in order to keep ourselves from being impure as well. Sometimes for good reason, we create specific guidelines on how people should behave, how people should dress, and how people should worship. Like the, the sort of music that we play at church, right? Hymns versus contemporary music. How much money I should give to ministries. Which school should I send my kids to, public or private? How long should we date before we get married? And also, some churches do identify themselves with certain denominations in order to preserve their distinctiveness of their tradition and their practices. Now, notice Jesus did not respond too kindly to the Pharisees, did he? In verses 6 to 8, come with me to your Bibles. Verses 6 to 8, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. And it is written, These people humor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Now, is Jesus saying that holding on to traditions and practices is wrong? Well, no, not really. There are so many great things that we need to recognize about the traditions and we need to celebrate and we need to treasure these traditions as well. Traditions help us connect with our past. They ground us in practices that form our faith in healthy ways. Yet holding on to traditions becomes a serious issue when we do the following things. Firstly, it becomes a serious issue when, when we treat man-made traditions as God made commandments. Let me say that again. When we treat man made traditions as God made commandments. This is when we treat human tradition like God's law and we enforce them accordingly. So, for example, the Pharisees' tradition of ceremonial washing is technically man made, but the Pharisees have made them as binding as God's commands and they consider everyone who's unable to do so terrible, sinful, or lesser. And it becomes a serious issue. Secondly, it becomes a serious issue when the traditions we hold break God's principles and commands. When the traditions we hold break God's principles and commands. This is when human tradition makes us go against what God has clearly shown in scripture. For example, Jesus cited the Pharisees' use of korban. Now, korban, what korban was, was that it's basically something that is dedicated to God as an offering or is dedicated to be given to the treasury of the church. Or temple, sorry. Now, if a son and a daughter have made a vow that the property is dedicated to God, so according to the Pharisees' tradition, they can't use it to support their parents. 
this supersedes their parents' rights to receive support. So if true today, it will allow baby Anastasia, especially once she grows up, to one day go up to Sherilyn and Elliot to say, Mom, Dad, you can forget getting any money from me since all my funds are korban or everything that I own is dedicated to the Lord. You can't touch any of this. So in upholding that tradition, Jesus is charging the Pharisees of this. The Pharisees were violating God's commands to honor one's parents by upholding their tradition. But the deeper issue goes beyond just merely holding on to tradition. It had to do with the approach that the Pharisees had towards Jesus. It had to do with their pride. See, the Pharisees were used to having a say in everything. So there's this new kid in the block, and all they could see was that this new kid, Jesus, was a threat, a threat to their traditions, a threat to their authority, a threat to their sphere of influence. So in their pride, the Pharisees looked down on Jesus and his disciples for not following their traditions and their regulations. It is clear that their concern was not for the honor of God, but their main concern is to discredit Jesus so that the traditions and practices will not be threatened. And think about it this way. The Pharisees have seen Jesus' miracles, yet refuse to see it as a sign that points towards his authority. They have heard him teach, yet instead of working out the truth of his claims, they are more concerned about the threat he posed to them. Here is someone who brings the ocean, but they are more concerned about maintaining their own puddles. They attempted to assert themselves over Jesus, and they refused to humbly come before his authority. It is worth reflecting on how this can be expressed in our own lives. Now, some of you guys in this room may, be, uh, may not be believers, and I want to say we are so glad that you're here, so a warm welcome to you all. Perhaps this is your first time hearing the Christian message, or you have been exploring its claims with a friend over time, with a friend who has brought you here today. Here's a question worth asking. Could it be possible that your objection to Jesus is not necessarily because what he claimed was untrue? Perhaps it is because accepting him means that you will no longer be able to assert your way. It may not be an issue of whether Christianity is true, but you don't want it to be true. After all, all of us can agree that coming to Jesus does not allow us to maintain control over the way that we live. This makes us extremely vulnerable, and so I understand how difficult it is. And for those of us in this room who are followers of Jesus, perhaps a good question to ask is, how do you end up treating those who do not think, behave, or worship the same way? Let me say that again. How do you end up treating those who do not think, behave, and worship the same way? So for example, do we often find ourselves looking down on brothers and sisters from another denomination? Do we subconsciously declare others as less holy because they do not use the same worship music or give as much as we do, know as much as we do, or dress a certain way? Whether we are believers or non-believers in this room, our pride is the common denominator that shapes the way we approach Jesus. Our pride will dictate whether or not we will receive Jesus with open arms or assert our will over the commands that Jesus gives. Our pride will lead us to look down on people who do not maintain the same standards we have. And as we come to the next section, Jesus shows us something that is important for us to acknowledge. So come with me to point two, the acknowledgement of our approach. From verses 14 to 23, Jesus addresses the broader issue of defilement with the crowd and then with the disciples. Now, we're going to zoom straight into the explanation. So come with me to your Bibles and read verses 18 to 19 with me. Verses 18 to 19. Jesus says, Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. In his reply, Jesus was addressing the assumption that often came with the Jewish approach. The physical act of cleansing in and of itself does not prevent true defilement. 
eating certain foods does not make us impure, since, as he says, nothing outside the person can defile them. And what was worse, and we must not miss it, Jesus highlights that what truly defiles us actually comes from, not from outside, but from within us. What makes us impure does not come from outside, but inside. It comes from the heart, where all our thoughts, actions, and motivations flow. Read verses 20 to 23 with me. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thought come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. In other words, what causes us to become impure actually comes from ourselves. And if we were honest, we all had similar assumptions to the Jews. For example, you have heard of the statement before, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now you notice really carefully that the assumption behind the statement is if anyone has power, whether or not it's the prime minister, whether or not it's a pastor within the church, if anyone has power, it will corrupt them. But in reality, it is our desire for control, a desire for recognition and influence that twists power. And instead of using it for good, we end up using it for ourselves. It is not that power corrupts, but it is our heart that corrupts power. Things external to us are not the problem. We are the problem. And I want us to encourage us to pause for a minute and think about the implications, right? If we assume that defilement comes from everything outside, then it means we can do something about it. We can make ourselves pure. If that were the case, then it will make sense for us to do everything under the sun, to maintain all sorts of practices, regulations, traditions, all of that to help us stay pure. It makes sense. Yet, if Jesus is right, if defilement and impurity comes from within our hearts, that means we are completely helpless and can do nothing to get rid of our defilement whatsoever. That we are completely helpless and we can do nothing to get rid of our defilement whatsoever. If you're feeling uncomfortable at this point, it is completely understandable. Many of us are aware of how impure we are before God. And many of us in this room, I'm sure, carry around a lot of guilt and shame. And so instinctively, we try to do things to help address the issue, and we try to deal with it ourselves uh, in some shape or form. Some of us try to do more good deeds to outweigh our bad. Some of us try to cover up by putting on a really, really bubbly personality or dressing and acting a certain way. Yet the thing that is common in all these approaches is that it deals with the external in the external without dealing with the internal. Focusing on outward actions does not address the broken motivations, wants, or desires that comes from our heart. For example, for those of us struggling with any sort of addiction, whether alcohol or porn, to a certain degree, seeking accountability or changing our lifestyle can help, but it does not stop our hearts from wanting to find comfort, significance, or control through these mediums. For those of us who are struggling with feeling insignificant within community, perhaps serving more in ministries may alleviate how you feel, but it can never solve or satisfy your heart's desire to find significance in everything else but God. Friends, we can do everything right on the outside, yet our hearts can still be far away from God. It is not what is external that defiles us, the evil in our hearts, the arrogance, the greed, the lust, the pride, that's what defiles us before God. Jesus forces us to acknowledge this. In our own defilement, we are completely helpless. See, no one in this room, let alone the world, has the will and power to remove the defilement of our hearts. There is only one 
and can remove our impure hearts and bring us before God completely washed and cleansed. So friends, if you are someone who feels weighed down by the guilt and shame of your impurity, if you are someone who feels unworthy or too impure to come before God, hear this. Only Jesus has the will and power to make you pure. You see, while we stand impure before God, Jesus was the only one who stood perfectly pure and undefiled. While you and I cannot bear to approach a holy God in all his holiness, Jesus could approach him without fail. Yet out of his great love for us, he became defiled for our sake. He took on our greed, he took on our lusts, he took on our envy, our arrogance, our immorality. He took on all the things, all the evil things that makes us impure. He took it all on himself. He took all that defiled us and placed the condemnation that we deserve on his very own body. Jesus cleanses us from our defilement once and for all through the shedding of his blood so that you and I can be clean and pure and experience the full forgiveness and new life with God once again. Where we fail, Jesus had succeeded. The good news reminds us that Jesus has addressed our defilement in our hearts in ways we couldn't. He completely removes any basis of pride we have. And so as we examine our final point, we'll learn about what it means to accept this as a reality as we approach Jesus. So come with me to our final point, the acceptance of our approach. So at the beginning of verse 24, we learned that Jesus entered a new region. As usual, you know, word got out and a woman whose daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out. We see that in verses 25 to 26. Now, Mark as an author, he was quite intentional in letting us know that the place that Jesus had gone to was a city that was filled with non-Jews or Gentiles. And he, the, the woman who Jesus was interacting with was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia, which is Mark's way of saying she is definitely not a Jew, right? And there's a reason why Mark does this. To the Jews and the Pharisees, the Gentiles are considered unclean and to enter a city filled with, in their eyes, dirty pagans is a massive no-no. So what Jesus did would have driven them mad. If this was the Pharisees' version of the game, the floor is lava, Jesus had essentially walked into lava. Of course, this didn't matter to Jesus and he interacts with the Gentile woman. But I want to highlight a few things that will act as a bit of a shock factor for us. Firstly, notice the way Jesus responded to the woman. Have a look at verse 27 with me. First, Jesus responds, first, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now this statement generally makes us do a double take, right? Wait, hang on, calling someone a dog, who? Jesus? No way. Maybe your Jesus would do it, but not my Jesus. But there's no running away from it, church. The very same Jesus who is compassionate, the very same Jesus who is loving, who loves sinners and tax collectors, had just called this woman a dog. What makes things worse is the content of what he said. You know, Jesus' statement has a deeper meaning. Bread represents his message or his message of salvation. Children represents the Israelites and the dogs represent non-Jews or Gentiles. In other words, Jesus was essentially saying to the woman, I am the savior of Israel. I have come for them first, so know your place and wait your turn. Now, scholars over the years have done their best to help people deal with how offensive Jesus was. One way was to show that when Jesus called this woman a dog, he was just using the term given to, you know, so your pet chihuahua or puppy, rather than the term for dirty strays on the street. Yet in all honesty, it does not remove the sting of Jesus' statement. Here was a woman, here was a woman who needed compassion, she needed Jesus to drive out the impure uh, demon or spirit from her daughter. 
and Jesus was essentially rejecting her, telling her that she did not come as a priority. So it's worth asking the question, if it were you, how would you feel if Jesus spoke to you like that? Potentially, in our gut reaction, we would become offended. Wait, hold up. Who are you to call me a dog? You know what? Who cares about what you think? I know who I am. I am strong. I am beautiful. I don't deserve to be treated like this. Or we can become sad and dejected. Oh, yeah, he's right. Oh, I'm such a dog. Woof. Who am I to expect Jesus to help someone like me? Whether we will feel offended or dejected, the outcome is the same. Most likely, all of us would have given up and walked away. Yet it is precisely knowing how we would naturally respond that makes the woman's response even more remarkable. Take a look at how she responds in verse 28. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Her response was shocking. She was neither offended nor was she dejected. She totally recognized her place as a Gentile before Jesus. In her approach, she accepted that the Jews have priority by virtue of being God's chosen people. So in terms of order, she recognizes and accepts that she is not first in line. Yet while she humbly accepted her place, she accepted Jesus not only as her Lord, but as the Savior. She knows that he has the power to save her daughter, so she would not take no for an answer, not when her daughter was at stake. This woman knows that her status meant that she cannot demand God's mercy. If it means getting a slither of Jesus' work or power for her daughter, get this, she was willing to accept the rank of a dog. She was willing to lose her pride in order to receive the prize of Jesus and his saving power. <laughs> this, this really puts all of us to shame. Like, how many of us are really able to display the same humility this woman showed? To accept that we have no right to demand God's mercy and grace? To accept the fact that without God, we are, as Paul puts it, utterly and completely dead in our transgressions and sins? unable to do anything to save ourselves? Are we able to lay aside any rights, any basis of boasting and approach him with childlike faith, with complete dependence on his grace and mercy? True humility accepts who we are before God, sinners who don't deserve anything good from him. Yet true humility also accepts who he is, our Lord, our Savior, the one that we completely depend on. Can we see that the thread that Mark uses to link the entire account together? Out of their pride, the Pharisees refused to humbly approach Jesus. Yet this non-Jew, this Gentile woman, was the one who humbly came before him as her Savior and Lord. The Pharisees would have easily barred her from salvation since she was a Gentile, since she was impure. Yet in responding to her and healing her daughter from the Spirit, Jesus demonstrates that the good news of salvation is very much for impure people like her. So by extension, I want us to see that this is good news for all of us. Since Jesus came to address our impurity, no one is ever going to be barred from salvation. None of us are called to rely on our own efforts and willpower for everyone. We are called to no longer assert what we think is best. We are called to acknowledge our complete helplessness, surrender our pride, and come before Jesus, accepting him as Lord and Savior over our lives. So as we conclude, here are some points to ponder in light of the sermon. First point to ponder, in your approach to Jesus, what are some traditions, customs, or standards you often refuse to surrender? What particular practices have you subconsciously banked on for making you pure and acceptable before God? And perhaps a little additional question to that is, how does that shape the way you treat those who are unable to meet those standards? Second point to ponder, how does our pride express itself in the way we approach prayer, 
reading God's word and church. So if I take prayer for example, perhaps our pride is expressed on how little we pray in order to depend on God. Rather than humbly coming before him and surrendering everything to him, we much rather take everything into our own hands. Last but not least, how can we cultivate a heart of humility that enables us to approach Christ in complete surrender? Perhaps it is resisting the urge to focus mainly on our external behavior. Perhaps it is recognizing our complete helplessness. And perhaps it is responding to Jesus, completely trusting in the fact that only he can make us pure. So as we approach God in prayer, may we ask that he would enable us to put aside our pride, humbly accept who we are before him, and accept Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. Church, let me pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you completely humbled. Father, we are reminded from Jesus' words that ultimately we stand impure before you. And Lord, we confess that there are many times that we have tried to take matters into our own, own hands. We try to do more good things to outweigh the bad. We try to cover up our shame and guilt. But Lord, we recognize that we can do nothing, nothing to remove the impurity of our hearts. And so, Father, Lord, may we rejoice in knowing that ultimately, though we can't do it, you can. Through Christ, you have removed our impurities so that we can come and find full forgiveness and new life in you. And so, Lord, may that lead us to throw ourselves at your feet, even if it means accepting the rank of a dog. Help us to come before you, accepting that you are our Savior and Lord, and rejoice and worship, glorifying you in everything that we do and finding joy in treasuring you above all else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.